Hi, this is Tony from Sonata Arctica, and you are watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey, what's up, guys? Episode 228 of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, calling from Zoom, and I'm here with Tony from Sonata Arctica. How are you doing today, Tony? Glad to have you on my show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Here. Awesome, man. So, uh, kind of like the format is, I want to talk about like your musical history, as well as talk about the upcoming Sonata Arctica album. So, take me back to young Tony. So kind of growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal? What made you want to be a vocalist? Well, first band that really got me into metal was 1997, Stradivarius. That was my first metal band with uh, Vision's album. But the first, I was like 22 years old at the time already. So I was an old bloomer when it comes to metal music. But the first band that I uh, really fell in love with ever, I remember it must have been like around... 85, 86, 85 maybe. Uh, when I when I saw Queen on TV, their live concert, and, and Queen was my big love and still is. And uh, I grew up basically from that day on listening to Queen. So that was my first rock love, so to say. Awesome. And so uh, tell me about like starting up Sonata Artica, because I know y'all formed in 96, but it was originally called like Tricky Beans. Yeah, first Triggy Beans, and then when we started playing this more metal-type music, it was transformed into Tricky Means. Huge change, but <laughs> it sounded better than Beans, I think. Anyhow, and uh, yeah, we were a bunch of friends. Um, um, I was actually in the same same band with uh, the second guitar player, uh, Sonata Arcticas, one of the early bass players, Marco. Uh, I was with him in a different band, and we were playing like weddings and such like danceable thing for older folk basically and he then wanted to start this like rock band with the idea that we would play mostly cover songs from Negadeth and and I don't know what just cover songs basically and I was supposed to do only singing and nothing else but you know knowing myself I I from the uh, Uh, I became so Arctica, and the first song that I wrote was Letter to Dana, which later on ended up on our debut album, Eclipse, as well. Awesome. Really cool. <laughs> awesome. So, so tell me about like the first album, Ecliptica. You get first, your first label was, of course, with Spine Farm. So, how did they find Sonata Arctica? Well, um, we had at that t time already recorded four demos with Tricky Beans slash Means, and uh, and the last one of those. Were was like heavily influenced by Stradivarius because I fell in love with their power metal thing, which was a weird thing because I hated their previous album, album episode. I just loathed it. It was like awful shit. I was into totally different kind of music at the time. So, but something happened, luckily, and uh, I fell in love with that band. And obviously, Tommy had to, from that day on, had to learn to play double kicks, which he didn't know how to play at the time. So and uh, we started uh, writing writing songs in this style and uh, faking it until we were actually making it and and uh, when we recorded this demo and it was finished the studio boss Ahti of Tico Tico Studio he asked that knowing that we would probably not send it anywhere this demo he asked is it okay if I send it to Evo of Spine Farm that he might actually even listen to this demo because it, it's something they might be interested in and we're like sure yeah like expecting nothing i was i was just happy to hear that he had actually heard it but he phoned uh, called me like not too many days after that and then offered like three album deal from the get-go and I was like wow <laughs> okay so that was a huge stump a jump start for a band we were basically like raw apples picked from the tree. We didn't have any experience being a real recording on artist band, but that that's the way actually Spine Farm worked. They found the young talent like Nightwish and Children of Bodom and, and made something out of them, gave them the chance to grow, to be what they are and were. Awesome. There. 
Also, and you know, this year does mark 25 years of Ecliptica. So think about it, uh, Tony, it's almost Crazy. 25 <laughs> years of that. Do you have like a different feeling about it now as to opposed to when you first put it out 25 years ago? No, oh, of course, you know, it was fresh thing and I, I was unable to listen to the whole thing for a year after it was released because I was too afraid of what it sounds like. Because mastering, when it was mastered, it sounded so different from the mix. It was like too crisp, in my opinion, but I don't know why I was thinking that. It was probably the mix itself sounded more organic and soft, I think, in a way. And, and, and I was so, somehow estranged by that, <laughs> the sound of it. But but anyhow, nowadays, uh, I think it, it's, it's full of enthusiasm of a young men who really do not know what they are doing and, and uh, are performing their art on the verge of their limit, the edge. And it and it sounds like it's a like a speeding train, bullet train that is about to derail any moment, but somehow manages to stay on the tracks. That's the feeling I get when I listen to Eclipsica. And it, it's a pleasant feeling. It makes the whole thing really organic in a way that it sounds like it has that oomph, that effect that you cannot fake with later albums anymore because you are not doing it for the first time anymore. And, uh, and, uh, and the older you get, more experienced you get, uh, the further away you drift from that youth and that, that first album feel. So yeah. uh, I'm very happy that I managed to get that album even done back in the day. Yeah. And when it was released, did you start like touring outside of Finland for the first time or was it still just local? Um, yeah, the first time we actually played any shows outside Finland was with uh, Stradivarius and Rhapsody, the European tour of, it was like seven weeks almost. And uh, I had gone on vacation to Sweden. We actually live like 20 kilometers away from Swedish borders. So the Sweden is taken and given, but it's right there. And then and Norway. So that was the only northern parts of Norway I had visited earlier. And suddenly we were going to, I don't know, like 10 or more countries all over Europe. And at that time, we didn't even have Euro yet. So every country basically had their own currency, which make, makes uh, made things a little bit interesting, to say at least. And, uh, and uh, it was just amazing, you know, suddenly being able to tour with the band that were your biggest heroes ever. It was, it was wonderful and a huge surprise. And, and we actually heard about the whole tour at the same day we were finished with the mixing and mastering of the album and i was just you know delivering the audio cd of that version to yeah, perfect fine timing fun. yeah perfect timing and then then riku the boss label label boss he, he that, um came and, and hey tony by the way you have some shows coming up and i was like oh uh, yeah interesting what is it thinking that it's probably like some like halloween or someone like that coming to play some some club in helsinki and we would be the support band there but no it's like a seven week tour with stradivarius and rhapsody in europe like <laughs> it was like ah it says you know whipped the air out of my lungs <laughs> and my stomach <laughs> drops and everything i wasn't expecting any any such thing to happen really and and uh <laughs> It was it was really scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you also did you like tour America for the first time around that cycle, or was it later on? No, that was later. Um, we were supposed to come there with. Um, I'm not sure. Was it like? Actually, it happened already with Reckoning Night album, our fourth album right. in 2005. The album was released in 2004. Uh, 2005. We were supposed to be uh, opening for Nightwish, supporting them on that tour, but they canceled the whole thing. And we thought, that, all right, that's up. That's we're done with our American dream. We are never going there. But the local promoter, the guy who took care of things there, he just had like touching a few pages here and there, and that found out that there's a lot of interest for some of the Arctica on that side of the paddle already at that point, and. And we we had this tiny, I don't know how many shows, maybe f uh, six or something like that shows in North America, Canada, and and and, and USA on the East Coast. Uh, that was our first thing, and ever since that, uh, already with that album, I, I think we came to North America three times, 
and I don't even know how many times we've been there. I must yeah. have spent like two years of my life in North America. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And tell me about the second album, Silence, because usually with the debut album, you have your entire life to write, and there's a lot of hype with the first album. When it came to making Silence, did you feel pressure to follow up Ecliptica? No, no, not at all. I, it was pleasurable, actually. I had a lot of material leftovers from the first album, things that we had already uh, uh, recorded and demoed with uh, Tricky Beans, Tricky Means, like Talula, for example. It, I tried and wanted to have it on the first album already, but everybody in the band, they were totally against it because it needed to be a metal album. And I, I, in hindsight, I think it was a smart idea and not to have two ballads on the album. Uh, Letter to Dana was better for that at that point. So, so there were a lot of songs uh, ready, but but the majority of the album has been uh, written after Ecliptica was released. And, uh, and it was it was great. Yeah. Great to, uh, uh, to hit the studio, and, and I, I really enjoyed songwriting. You know, it was more ambitious and everything, and I sort of knew what I wanted to do. And I had found more like my own voice, both as a songwriter and as a singer at that point. And then going into uh, Winter Hearts Guild, I love that album. Def definitely pretty much my favorite Sonata Artica album. So what was the thought process going from Silence to Winter Hearts Guild? Mm, just keep on going, you know, uh, and then do it better. And I, I think uh, it, it's my favorite Sonata Artica power metal album, I think. It has a lot of like I'd, I'd call them some of the Arctica classics on that song. And then, and then it's, it's one of our best albums in my opinion. Yeah. Like songs well, like and, uh, silver was, tongue, just, broken, you know, great songs. Yeah. The cage. And uh, the, there are just like a lot of Victoria's secret, <laughs> many, 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 many uh, broken. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's just a wonderful album. And, and, uh, it's a shame that we did not really tour with that album. We played like maybe 45 shows and didn't really leave Europe anywhere. We didn't. I, I think we played a few shows in Japan, but that's about it. And that was actually the first tour that Henrik, uh, our keyboard player, he joined the band, but didn't play on the album yet. So that's why I probably wanted to have the tour really short and hit the studio and have an album out with Henrik playing on it as soon as possible. So awesome. that's probably reason and then going into the next album reckoning night i thought that was a really good album album too and you know this year does mark the 20 year anniversary of that so i know we have the new album coming is there a chance maybe we can get some like deep cuts on the next sonata Artica tour we'll see we'll see we are actually right at this moment thinking about what we are going to play we have played quite a few songs from the olden days lately and uh but I, I think it, it's healthy to uh mix the soup a little bit and, and find something new to play because we are already toured europe with uh Stradivarius once again uh mm -hmm. late la last year playing uh, those songs a lot of those songs so uh yeah most likely we will pick up something actually hendrik was requesting that can we do that as soon as possible pick up the song song because he again wants to start rehearsing and and Combining his set of sounds that he's going to use and everything. So that's going to be next week. This thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I love about Reckoning Night, I love there's like a but like a little hidden track jam, which is sort of like a uh, flamenco style tune. So what made you guys decide <laughs> to do that? I thought that was really interesting. But I know it, I think it's like on the Japanese version of the album. Yeah. The jam. Yeah. Um, we wanted to have something weird, something funny for the fans. And, uh, and on, on many of our early albums, we had some kind of uh, goof thing thing at the end. Well, Winterheart's Guild had this uh, uh, Greenpeace bird steak kind of thing. <laughs> Talking, we had a bird in the studio and I, I shot a video of it and then just used the audio of it uh, at the end of the album. I think it must have been Winterheart's Guild actually, but yeah. Yeah. Or was it Reckoning Night? It's it's so long time ago. I thought yeah, it's Reckoning Night. It's on Reckoning kind of Night. Things, Reckoning Night. Yeah, I've, it's been so long time that I, I thought I would remember such things forever. But here we go. It's starting to fade. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, but I know in between Reckoning Night and Unia, you did a little side project, Rascata 
Yolula, Rasta which is just Yolula, a, yeah. It's yeah. like I uh, forgive me if I butcher any Finnish names names, but I know you did like that <laughs> su- little self titled album, which is basically just like a Finnish Christmas song music. So what made you decide to like do like a little Christmas little thing? It's actually like Finnish version of uh, Trans Siberian Orchestra, and it's still going strong. I don't even know how many albums we have, but it's the biggest tour in Finland that happens every year. We play like arenas like the most people we've had in one show has been eleven thousand, which is big in finland uh, so that has grown ever since that quite a bit we have released multiple albums have they've sold like triple platinum in finland and all that so it's a big thing and we have a lot of singers basically the cream of the crop of finnish rock metal singers are there and then we have a uh, singers from outside uh finland like elise rude of, of uh, amaranth and uh Tommy Karevik uh, and, and and such singers yeah. that have visited there, and uh, Jeff Tate was there this year as a guest really? as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we had Dee Snider and uh, Jolin Turner <laughs> and such yeah. such funny things. <laughs> yeah, I know you did that. So, it, so it's yeah, it's it's a really huge thing that happens here in Finland, and I'm, I'm super happy to be part of that. Yeah, and, I'm happy and... that I was asked to do it from the get go. Yeah, and I know you did that first album, Raskampa Yolola, and you did yeah. uh, Mi Kame Yolin Vieton and Pienne yeah. Rompale. I just yeah. think those are Little really good boy. songs. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, yeah. yeah I I like like make it... We have also in, we have an also an English uh, version of that thing, Ragnarok Yule Side, that we released yeah. one album in English, so... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you feel like like singing in like Finnish, like almost kind of like it makes it like personal in a way? Yeah, absolutely. And these are very traditional Finnish Christmas songs. Most of them. We also have original material that we are playing, but but they are very emotional. And uh, every time you play some certain songs, you can see people crying in the audience, and it's very touching. And uh, because of the Finnish Christmas songs, unlike the American "Happy Happy Joy Joy." Kind of Christmas songs, ours are gloomy. Someone dies, and and children are neglected, and, and things go sideways. So there's no very much happiness in Finnish Christmas songs, yeah. usually. So <laughs> they are super different from what you have there. That's why, in certain point of my life, I could not tolerate the Finnish Christmas song songs, and and I think that's also the reason why this. Uh, our approach of playing those songs in a heavier way has uh, resonated strongly in the Finnish population because there have been a lot of people who just could not be have, have not been able to play uh, and listen to any Christmas music uh, until Raskasta Joulua Heavy Christmas came to be and uh, now they are fans and it's, it has become a family tradition for a lot of people to come and see the show every year. Yeah. yeah. Then kind of going back in the Sonata Arctica in 2007, you did Unia. Tell me about that. Junia, um, I think Reck- uh, Reckoning Night already was like a little bit of a foretoken of, of change. It, it was different from parts uh, in comparison to three first albums. and uh, But Unia change was huge. I mean, that album became sort of controversial. Some people say that it's their favorite Sonata Arctic album, but at the time anyways, it was mostly hated by people who were expecting more of the same. <laughs> and it, it was a huge shock for a lot of uh, people, but it, I think it has very nice songs, uh, maybe too progressive and, and uh, too much of that weird Sonata Arctic material on that album. But but other than that, I think it's, it's a, a fine piece of work. In my opinion, and and, and it was um, in a way uh, at the time I thought it was like a catharsis for me. Like uh, I was feeling now hindsight thinking when I'm older and smarter, I I believe that I was uh, having a little bit of burnout going on at the time. We had played almost two hundred shows, I think, with Regan Nights so, and and going directly in the studio after that album and. And uh, especially when Reckoning Night album was done in such a fast pace as well. So uh, I had been working too hard for too long and, and just one started to sort of 
rebel against some of the Arctica and metal music and wanted to do something different. And in hindsight, I probably should have released at that point some kind of solo album. Yeah. And like, at least use some of these songs that we have on Junior on that album. Yeah. And keep some of the Arctica, some of the Arctica. Yeah. Yeah. You tried to experiment. But was that sort of like the catalyst to eventually? I know you did Northern Kings that same year. You did those two albums, Reborn and Rethroned, with, uh, of course, of course, Marco, formerly of Nightwish. So was that sort of like the, the catalyst for that? Uh, no. It, those things have nothing, nothing to do with each other. Actually, uh, uh, Northern Kings is a sort of, it, it's been created by the same people who are working on, on Raskasta Joulua. So that's like the same group of people who are in the band and the same group of singers who are actually singing uh, bo both both projects. Marco was, and he he's still a part of, of Raskasta Joulua as well. So it was just, I don't know who actually came up with the idea, but I was asked to join and I was like, sure thing, let's do this. And it was a lot of fun. And we actually had, couple of years ago our first show was in a long long time playing those songs and it was it was crazy fun yeah yeah and i've i've actually recently checked it out and that's actually pretty cool cool it would be cool if northern kings did a tour in the states i'd buy tickets in a heartbeat yeah yeah that'd be cool yeah and then kind of go talk about the next Sonarica album, The Days of Grays. I think that's another really great album. And, you know, this year does mark 15 years of that album. So what was, what was like the thought process going into making The Days of Grays? Because I think it has some great songs on there. There are such as like uh, The Last Amazing Grays, Zeros, Juliet. And I don't th think the whole album is really good. Pretty much a very underrated album, in my opinion. Um, I agree with you there. It's definitely one of my uh, favorite sort of albums and uh, and uh, I sort of it, it tried and was a sort of um, a correction of the direction of Son of the Arctic uh, in, a, in a way that it was pulling us back to what we were before and I think the production is much better we uh, I had like outside help making the orchestrations and everything whereas Unia was my just I was just doing everything and trying to do everything too much and uh, that's the way you burn out as well, <laughs> I think. So <laughs> when you just can't let go of anything. So uh, it was a healthier process in many ways. And I enjoyed writing the songs. Um, they have, in a, in a way, more emotional depth on those songs. There are a lot of uh, pretty deep songs. But I've, I've, some of them I've only myself come to realize and understand totally when I, I, I become a little bit older. Sometimes you write things that are cool and you think this could be actually a real thing for some people. And, and then you later realize that, shit, this actually is a real thing. And, and, and then the meanings of uh, like the uh, underlying meanings that some songs have, they might actually come to you in a totally different light when you are suddenly 20 years or 15 years older. And it, 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 it was I loved making that album and I, I I think it turned out really well yeah and one thing I love is like you did we did like an old song from the tricky be beans days called flat flag in the ground so what made you guys yeah. decide to like re redo it and rework that song in particular uh, I thought that song uh, deserved to have a life it, it was like happy happy choy choy and one of the I think it must have been the second or third song that I ever wrote for Tree Beans, later Son of Arctica. And uh, I, I just wanted to, it to have a new life. I love the theme that it had. So I, I just, you know, rearranged the thing and, and wrote new lyrics for it. And then there we had a Son of Arctica song. And of course, it became the single. Yeah. <laughs> and not our choice either. It was a label. They were strongly thinking that this must be the... The, the single, the first single from the album, and I'm like, sure, yeah, I think it was a good choice too. It, it's it's catchy, and yeah. this theme and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. And tell me about the next album, Stones Grow Her Name. Emma, I thought that that's another very underrated album. So, what was that like going from Days of Grace to Stones Grow Her Name? Um, I played the demos to the guys, and 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 they loved the, the whole idea of, of uh, uh, recording and releasing an album with that style whereas myself I was thinking that this is is it too soft is it this is just like 
pop rock in part or like hard rock or whatever weird different kind of music that we have ever really yeah is and although there are songs that are probably the most metal that sort of has never ever released on the same album so it's a versatile piece of work uh so um Henrik especially was thinking that no, this is the best best <laughs> best thing ever and it, it was strongly uh, uh into you know going into that direction and I was like sure yeah and, uh, had we not done that we would not, not have been able to release the album as, as uh, that year still because I, I should have started rewriting some of the songs I think it yeah. turned out really well the production is, is very good and Nico Carmilla did a great job mixing the album and it actually got some really high marks in some really uh, unexpected magazines in Finland like magazines that are really concentrated on the sound and hi-fi kind of aspect and when we got high marks from for, for the sound and everything so that was happy happy thing yeah. to happen and, and of course uh, i think one of our biggest is hits i have a right was on that album as well so yeah it was a good experience yeah and then i know in 2013 you sort of did the self-titled album with raska the the eula uh, tell me about like that um you know, I was just a singer as I am on that project. I really do not have anything else to do <laughs> with it. So I can't even remember. I, probably I, I sang the songs that I have there in my home home studio in a box, and uh, and um, that's about it. Yeah, it, it's it's yeah. I it, these it's very healthy. I think at least for me to have such a project where I can let go of as many strings as possible and just, you know, enjoy and uh, have a, a really re uh, ready-made arrangements and everything and just enjoy the singing and and do my best on that. that yeah. That part. So it, it's, I, I really do not have much to say about the production on those yeah. albums. Right. I'm just very happy to be part of that thing. And for me, the live performance and the live experience of Raskas Tayolo is the, is the thing, you know, meeting all the great people and then spending time with them. It's like a family on the road. Yeah. And sort of like, like, like how, like how different of a mind frame is it with, with that, that, that project and with Sonata Artica, do you have to like, be, like be in a certain like mind frame depending on the project? Mm, well, it, it's, it's, uh more like a vacation when you go on, on tour with Raskas Tayolua, because usually we have at least four singers on, on, on any given show, sometimes even more than 10. So it, it's, it's uh, the responsibility is much less. <laughs> you don't have to worry about singing all the time and spending the whole night on, on, on stage. And uh, the, 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 everything is much bigger. Of course, the shows are bigger and, and all the whereas Sonata Arctica, we do, do not usually have a lot of spectacular things happening on stage. Raskas Teola, then again, they have everything pyros and video screens, and, and you name it, they have it. And it's, it's just a wonderful experience going there. But it's then again, you know, Sonata Arctica is the one thing that I, I really love, and, and, and it gives different kind of emotions. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's my, life's main thing my work and uh, I'm, I'm very proud to, to have at least tommy of the original crew the drummer in the yeah. band still and then and he will never ever go anywhere unless uh, he really wants to yeah and and uh anyway kind of going into the next sonata Arctica album pariah's child i thought that that's a pretty good album and you know this year does mark the 10 year anniversary of that there's like so many anniversaries in the sonata Arctica <laughs> camp Cam, yeah. so so what was that like so what was that like making Pariah's Child? Um Bussy joined the band with that album and he had actually had recorded many of our albums in the past in Studio 57. So the new bass player was introduced 10 years already. Jeez. Um I remember just being super tired when we were making that album because my second child was born <laughs> around that time so and uh, the, he was a tiny baby and keeping me awake all the time so i just remember be, being totally exhausted and, and underslept <laughs> so it, just, it was a nightmare in that sense but also it gave me um 
further certain um i don't know perspective on things once again you know my other kid who was born uh right uh, around time of, of uh, uh the previous album you know he, he um, caused such songs as, as i have a right to happen and uh and this of course continued on the on the on the, on the prayers child and uh, um there are few songs that i would very much like to bring on the set list but i don't know hopefully we can do this on the yeah. on, on, on now on, on when you go on the road yeah i'd like to see uh, like wolves die young cloud factory yeah. you take yeah. one breath yeah yeah take one breath would be excellent i would love to do that song but we'll see it's a little bit progressive yeah. and we have never actually played it live but Wolf Star Young is a safe bet. We have played that a lot. And then Cloud Factory being a little bit goofy song, but we might still bring it back. Yes, at least we yeah. played it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Anyway, moving on to the next album, The Ninth Hour. I thought it was really good. I also love the album artwork with the very, the nature with sort of like the, the, the little gears and stuff. It looks really amazing. So tell me about like that. Yeah, I loved making that album. We had a uh, guest stars there, like Troy of Nightwish playing uh, uh, We Are What We Are. And there are a lot of songs that I love so much, like We Are What We Are. It's just amazing. I love that song. And and uh, Closer to an Animal, it, it was one of the biggest radio hits in Finland, at least for some of our team. And it was constantly played on radio rock here in Finland and everything. And uh, it was just a labor of love in many ways and at the time i was i was super concerned about many things in the world politics nature and everything and, and sometimes i think of, um, was it a little bit too preachy <laughs> the whole album but uh, then again it was a sign of time and, and sort of functions as a diary moment in that way at least for me probably for many other people's people as well so yeah. um yeah and then then of course the the, the previous album tal tal video i probably that'll be uh, winter night in in english yeah winter yeah. night i'd like <laughs> i like that that album yeah. and I, that was like so far the only time i've ever saw you guys was on that cycle you did that tour with camel Molot and of course your fellow Finns and battle beast so tell me about that um yeah um that was a little bit uh challenging album for me to well songwriting was fun i love that but but at the time uh, i was having huge difficulties singing and uh, all you singers out there if you are experiencing uh, such a thing that it feels like your lungs uh, are empty within a second when you start singing it's like uh, and you can't make this eh, really nasal kind of thing that is a sort of very super essential when you're trying to sing to be able to produce such a thing uh, my version of it at the time was like huh. <laughs> and, and my lungs were empty and that was a tongue tension issue that i had and i managed to like conquer it and first of all find it and that was the reason so uh, you might want to look into tongue tension if you are experiencing huge problems there are uh, yeah. cures for that thing stretching mostly but yeah and uh and that of course that affected my singing performance on that album and i do not love <laughs> myself on that album at all i love the songs they are wonderful songs but but uh my vocals are just shit and if given a chance one day to sort of remake this album a little bit i would love to sing my bits again there's nothing else to maybe change but my vocals and maybe in hindsight, uh, oh, I'm running out of battery, 10% less. It's, it'll be okay. Um, uh, I I think we should remix it in the sense that uh, people have told us that it, it, it's been, it is too sort of dark, too murky somehow and soft, the mix. And, and uh, maybe it is a, it should have, we should have maybe have had a little bit different kind of approach with mixing instead of trying to make things sound really warm and uh, organic we should have taken the metal approach and i think this album would have definitely benefited uh, uh having such a thing and, and uh, I, I think it's 
alongside with Uni, it's one of our most criticized albums to date. And uh, definitely was one of the reasons uh, Fear Called Beyond turned out to be totally different in many ways. And we made huge changes with things. Yeah. And then you start touring for the album. And then, of course, that certain virus that shall not be named happened. And during that time, you also did like two uh, acoustic albums of like some acoustic editions of songs. So what made you guys decide to do like some acoustic albums? Uh, yeah, those acoustic things, they were in a pipeline already before the thing that should not be mentioned happened. And, and they would have been there regardless. But we would have released them a little bit earlier. We were trying to... Uh, hit on the road with those and, and postponed the the release as to be able to tour for the obvious reasons and uh, these acoustic things we've been playing around them with with acoustic versions of our songs ever since our early career we've played some some like acoustic interludes on our shows and sometimes even played acoustic festivals in Finland and, and it has worked really well and we've tried uh, to sort of ask our labels, and that, is it possible for us to make an acoustic version of of, of uh, our music? And then they uh, have been like, yeah, no, it's probably not going to work really well. And it probably does not for a lot of heavy metal bands. But as we are slightly different, <laughs> and the songs have this sort of traditional structure and, and they are based on, on melodies always, so it, it makes it easier. And uh, eventually... I can't even remember which year it was, but we decided against all odds and, and our better judgment to go on a European tour playing the songs that are on the album albums now acoustically and, and tour Europe. And our label, they came to see the show and they actually fell in love with the whole thing. And this actually, it's surprisingly good. Oh, wow. They loved it and gave us green light to the studio and record these things. And, and that's how how um, these acoustic adventures came to be. And that's also one of the reasons why Clear Call Beyond is so uh, different from many, many other past albums that we've had. Yeah. Because we finally were able to get this thing out of the system. And, you know, we toured for 10 weeks around Europe playing these songs acoustically. And at the end of that tour... I can tell you, we were super ready to do something totally different for a change. Yeah, and then top, and then of course now we have the new album, Clear Cold Beyond, which comes out March eighth through Atomic Fire Records. So, what was the whole writing and recording process like for the new album, and how the whole thing came to be, and that good stuff? Well, um, the only thing was that I, I knew that I need to sort of get myself back into the mode, songwriting mode, and and, and, and kick that power metal mode on. Uh, I knew uh, I had like certain methods of writing that kind of music back in the day, and I just had to re-spark that thing and, and find the way of doing it. And once I was done and ready and managed to write the first of those songs, there was no ending. The songs just kept, kept on coming and coming, and at, at some point we had to start recording the drums and at that point, we had already too much, too many songs to have on one album. And I just asked the guys, that ask, I am still coming up with more songs. Should I keep writing or should I concentrate perfecting what we have here and then cho choose the songs that we actually are going to have on the album? And then they agreed that maybe, maybe we'll, you know, stop the songwriting process and, 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 and concentrate on what we have. And then I think that was the only smart idea and smart thing to do. Uh, and uh, it was easy. Songwriting process was easy. The only problem was lyrics once again. And uh, I always tend to leave that to the very last moment possible. And uh, <laughs> but luckily, we went on tour in the middle of the recording process to Latin America. One of those uh, postponed tours that we were supposed to have already in March 2020. And we finally got to go there a year ago, and uh, and uh, we had a lot of spare time there. So I spent most of that time uh, writing song lyrics, sitting by the pool under a palm tree in sunshine, you know, having a drink in my hand and writing lyrics to songs. So most of these lyrics are, are written in a very different uh, environment in comparison to what I live in here in dark, cold Finland. Yeah, and I, I in some way, as as uh, the point and idea was to have a little bit more positive approach 
with the lyrics, you know, taking uh, what kind of uh, situation the world had been in for a couple of years already. So I think that was also the healthy thing. People have had enough of misery. So let's bring some, some at least some positive things in the songs and then try to be a positive version of Sun Antarctica. So uh, definitely that sunny uh, atmosphere there, it probably helps at least yeah. with some of these songs. Yeah. And musically, did you want to continue in the same vein as Tal Talvio or did you want to try something different that Sonata Artica hasn't done before? In a way, yeah, we definitely wanted to do something different, but that different was going back to the power metal and have an album that compares well with the early Sonata Artic albums like We Are Outskilled and, and such. And, and go back into the speedy stuff and then have an album that has an impact to the hits hard and then show people that we, are, we can still do it if we choose to do that. And, and I think that was definitely the right choice. And, uh, you know, we had played uh, on our 25th anniversary tours, festivals in, in Europe, uh, and a lot of these uh, our metal South Arctica songs. And, and it was wonderful to see that the people still respond and love these uh, classic some of the Arctic power metal songs, and then and uh, the response was just great. So that also uh, sort of helped a lot making that decision to go back. And this is what we want to be. This is what some of the Arctic is supposed to be. Yeah. And I and of course, like Sonata Artica is definitely one of the best like power metal bands in the scene. But if you were to like tell like fan who is just beginning to listen to the genre, how would you you like describe it to them? Mm, power metal or our this latest album or like you I mean in in general the music style? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is that's a pretty good description. <laughs> Well, no, no, no. I, 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 um, I'd say if you take your pop song, rock song that has intro, melodic uh, verse, some kind of pre-chorus and, and sing-along type chorus and repeat and make that sound hard, <laughs> that's when you have power metal uplifting stuff that uh, is supposed to make you feel something and give you energy to go through the day. I think that's how you would describe power metal and Sonata Arctica best way. Yeah. Most of the times. Yeah. <laughs> and sort of like talking about like the songwriting, writing. so what is usually like the songwriting process for you guys to make a song? Um, early on, I didn't have any computers, basically, so I was just writing on my keyboard and, and putting things down on paper. And in a way, I missed that. It was a wonderful organic way, and we, you know, rehearsed together and chanted and everything, and that those days are gone. Also, a little bit difficult to make happen, like, like casually, a few times a week to go and, and have fun and play with the guys, because everybody's living in a different places. We are living in three different cities, actually four. Currently, so it's hard to you know combine our forces. So it's basically internet. I I make all the songs, write them, and then make the arrangements uh, pretty much the way they are. Finally, at the album as on the album as well, and just you know send the tracks to the guys so they can learn their bits and pieces, and and, and then we rehearse together and uh, hit the studio, and that's it. It right. has changed, and I sort of I I miss. The human interaction in the process a lot yeah. in a way but but, but then again uh, this approach allows me to make more complex <laughs> mistakes i suppose but also complex arrangements and everything yeah and talking about like like the the lyrics because i think of course the lyrics like i know you talk about like fantasy stuff but also like life and love and relationships so when it comes to like the making of the lyrics do you have to like put yourself in that mind frame to come up with lyrics or just the lyrics just come naturally and organically for you uh, most of the time it's a little bit of a struggle i need to sort of get into the song in a way and then and uh, come up with some kind of weird mock-up lyrics often. And uh, I'm trying to read news and watch movies and write down certain ideas and, and lines that I come across. And, 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 and oftentimes the first uh, you know, draft 
of the lyrics are very weird. They might be just a like bunch of random lines here and there that somehow work within the song. But sometimes, uh, eventually, I will find the root where I can actually build and then and, and, and dig up the whole song out of that one idea and and um, find out what this song wants to be and what is it it is about yeah um, and uh, during the time when i'm actually writing lyrics it's weird because my uh thinking that turns into english being a finnish i usually think in finnish but but uh, uh, at that time I, i'm so deep into the lyrics and everything that i i, I tend to speak uh, think in english and I, when i'm speaking with my Friends, for example, I, I think in English and then have to translate it in Finnish. <laughs> so that's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And does yeah does it does it try to, does it hard to like try to like like figure it out in English like in terms of like the vo the phrasing and how you fit like the vocal patterns within like the instrumentals. Uh, it's not that hard anymore. It used to be definitely back in the day, but but I, I've learned what works for me. Like the, this weird things like like certain vowels are more difficult to sing from a certain range and have at, at the end of the word. Like E is a nightmare sound to sing for a very long time at the end of the song. It sounds like very awful. <laughs> I think at least when I do it. So I, I rather have like A oh, eh, in the end. It's, a, it's an easier vowel to produce as a singer for me. And, uh, and some yeah. tiny things that you've learned that it definitely affects your songwriting, lyric writing, because you need to take these into account as well and make these songs singable as well. Being a Finnish and not native English speaker, I, I have uh, certain restrictions when it comes to pronouncing things. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and but uh, on every album, I sort of still try to get out of my usual trick back that I have and then come up with something new. Yeah. And talking about play playing live, how different of, of it mind frame is it to like play live versus to record? Is there any differences or similarities between the two? Mm, recording and singing live. They are completely different animal. Uh, when I'm recording the songs, I'm, I'm at the same time often creating the melodies and, and, and phrasings and such things might change when I'm, I'm, I'm recording, if I come up with something new. <laughs> but then again, that kind of thing might happen also in a live show. If I come up with something tiny, a bit different vocal line or something, I might start using that. And then it will be a, a different version of, of, of the same thing, basically. But, but yeah, it's, um, I much prefer singing live. It's a complete experience, uh, you know, having the audience there and, and you are actually singing and you know much more, you know better what you are doing at that point because you the song is ready when you're doing it live instead of in a studio where you are very much uncertain of certain things. At least I am because I, I don't record very much or at least often like ready demos with vocals. It's they are instrumental mostly. Yeah, and, yeah, and so kind of like so, in the end, end to wrap things up. What's next next for Sonarica? I know we got the release of Clear Cold Beyond, which comes out March eighth. Is there just anything else in terms of like touring and stuff that you have planned? And when can we expect Sonata Artica to come back to the USA? Um, yeah, the tour in fin tour starts in Finland first, and and uh, then uh, spring. Summer festivals are so close that we are taking a tiny break <laughs> already after the first <laughs> like run of shows in Finland and, and uh, summer festivals in Europe, Finland. And uh, European tour, the biggest tour of this uh, uh, with this album uh, will start in September this year. And I'm not sure we might go to have a few shows somewhere that I can't really talk about yet after that. But North America is still don't know. I really very much hope to come and play there and have the tour, but it is getting, it's been getting increasingly difficult for a band of our size, you know, because uh, uh, everything's getting so much more expensive, uh, the bus and the uh, fuel and uh, 
working visas are much more expensive than they used to be and and everything it, it, it's not easy for a small band like Sonatarctica to make it happen but I do hope that we get to visit North America many more times because it's my favorite continent to tour definitely yeah so uh Kitos, Tony. Is there just uh, any final words you want to say to the viewers that are watching this to close this out? Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, go. Uh, the, this world, music world, the venues, the bands, and, and the crews that work there, they have suffered a lot the last few years. So if you have a favorite uh, venue nearby, go and see any band that you can even tolerate to an extent go and support that venue and that band also because when you are buying tickets to a live show and buying merchandise from touring bands you are keeping the whole industry alive and then and, and probably if you do that enough you may have a chance to see live shows in that favorite venue of yours also with your own children one day and, and, and it's something that you cannot take for granted so keep the venues alive <laughs> so we have some place to return <laughs> hopefully soon <laughs> awesome <laughs> so everybody tony kako from sonata artica see you next time see ya <laughs>